May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. It is a moment that holds all the possibility. There was nothing, and now, light. The dawning of the new day, the start of everything. But what is everything? What was all of the possibilities that God was dreaming in that moment? There's this pause as God declares the day good or the light good and a sense of what now in the text. Now we know God keeps going. Life develops first in the oceans, then plants onto land, then dinosaurs and ice ages and humanoids of various variety until by some miraculous confluence of design and circumstance, we get us, humanity, the creation of God over the last mere two million years. That's a ton of possibility. We get the wheel and fire, and we also get murder. We get communities and family, and we get tribalism and hatred. We get cathedrals, and we get inquisitions, industry, and environmental waste. In the beginning, there was nothing. And then there was light, and everything suddenly had a chance, the good and the bad. One of my most favorite lines comes from one of my childhood books that I have reread as an adult on numerous occasions, Anne of Green Gables, where Anne, who messes up in a steady stream of miscalculations, daydreaming, and temper outbursts is told by her beloved teacher, Miss Stacy, tomorrow is fresh with no mistakes in it yet. <laughs> it is all hope and all truth in the same moment. Yes, tomorrow we start anew. And we get that haunting yet because we know ourselves and we're likely to muddle through to some extent and to make all new mistakes. It is the blessing and the curse of the new beginning that all things are possible, the good and the bad. Now, baptism at its heart is a beginning. As we note in scripture, every time John's baptism is brought up, it has a little like moniker after it. Do you catch it? What are all of John's baptisms? Matthew, what were all of John's baptisms? Did you catch that word? I put him on the spot. Repentance. John's baptism of repentance. But Jesus seems to be doing something new in this baptism moment, that it is a beginning of a different sort. We catch Jesus in this moment of baptism as it is written as a beginning. Mark doesn't mince circumstances either. This is how he kicks off his gospel. There is no room for birth, for adolescence, for lessons learned. We are at chapter 1, verse 4 in the gospel of Mark. We meet John. Jesus gets baptized. And Mark wants to note that John's baptism of repentance doesn't seem to fit because Jesus is many things, but he is not a sinner. He is not in need of repentance. He comes to the waters doing something different. 
Mark writes, as Jesus comes up from the water, the Holy Spirit descends. As God speaks from heaven, the miracles, the relationships, the reclaiming the bridge to all of God resounds. We can hear it in the language. Also we know in the text is the makings of all the subversion, all the jealousy, all of the fear of the trial yet to come, of the torture, of the crucifixion, and yes, even the resurrection. Jesus' baptism begins his earthly ministry, and in that beginning includes all of the parts and possibilities. Not just this high point pinnacle, but also the tragedies yet to come. Now, it isn't an accident that from this big, momentous beginning, we immediately get Jesus going into the wilderness for prayer and alone time. There was light. This is my beloved. And there again, the text seems to pause with the prayerful question, what now? Now, Mark doesn't leave Jesus with what now for too long. He lets us know that the world has come crashing in with John's arrest. So if Jesus was indeed in those moments saying to God, okay, what now? It's been asked and answered. John's ministry is ending. It's time to pick up a different mantle. And Jesus begins to call and collect a team. His baptism demarcates something different, a new type of beginning, not one of repentance, but one of empowerment, where now it's time to get going. Now, this is the time of year where we ponder new beginnings. Now, as the priest, I'm supposed to remind you that, in fact, the new year started in the church for Advent, so you're four weeks behind, beginning with the gospel stories, which seems like a logical place for the church to start the year. Secularly, however, we call this the new year because January, of course, kicks off the calendar year, and so maybe we write some resolutions, we claim how we're beginning anew. I'll admit, for me, January doesn't seem so much like the beginning as much as the end of August, beginning of September feels like my new beginning every year. Everyone's back from vacation, and when they close the pool, somehow my brain clicks back on. Kids start a new school year, and that focuses me into resolutions and beginning anew. I'm sure within the pews this morning, there's any number of feelings of personal beginnings that we may not hold communally. New jobs, new retirement, new sports teams or seasons new personal resolve because of some great epiphany in our own lives. Frankly, in my own house, every time we clear a virus as a household, I feel like that is such a, like the first morning, let there be light, go to school. There are so many things to consider as we take on these new beginnings. We often jump immediately to like what in the here and now, do I need to accomplish? And there's a lot of valid goals to jump on for that purpose, from cleaning out, to cleaning up, to getting healthy, to dry Januaries, to 40 bags in 40 days, to changing our attitudes. But ultimately, if we're honest with ourselves, so many of those resolutions we come up with are more means than they are ends. I mean, why clean out? Why buy less? Why be different? Why think differently? Why change who you are? Unless guided by some larger point or purpose. Now, the why of Jesus' baptism, the why of Jesus' ministry is clear from the get-go in Mark. The work, his work and purpose are just a clear line from his baptism through to the resurrection, and Mark doesn't frill it up at all. From the moment he comes out of the water, Scripture says he saw the heavens torn apart, the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, 
the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Oh, to have that clarity on January 1st. Now, in our own lives, however, we don't get the no-nonsense narrator like Mark, who cuts clear the unnecessary detail and boils our lives down to such clear point and purpose. Instead, we must do it. We must claim point and purpose and not get sidetracked by small means without knowing the full picture of our own ends. Now, this realization, however, feels tremendous and overwhelming. It is that let there be light moment of all the potential and possibility, not only of this new day, but of your entire life and existence. What do you want to accomplish? What is your destiny? And in all of that possibility is all of the fear of not fulfilling it, of the ways we could be wrong, do it wrong, and screw it up royally. It can be completely paralyzing to consider how much we could do and how much we can do wrong. Now, choice is a funny thing. With too little choice, we feel controlled, and the monotony of life comes pretty strongly at us. But too much choice makes it impossible to choose. Now, when my kids were little, I loved taking them places like Meadowside Nature Center or Rose Hill Manor that's like just over in Frederick. Now, in part, this is just a tremendous change of scenery for Mommy, who's excited to make a mess in a new location. But they'd go to these places with a handful of activities. So if you've ever been to Meadowside back when they decided to be open, there was a cave, and there was like a pioneer little zone, and there was like a little canoe, and then you had like the reptile area. And in each of them had just like a handful of things to do. Or if you go up to Rose Hill Manor, you go into the nursery, and there's at max 10 toys in the whole place. They're on like little shallow shelves. There's two little dress-up things. There's a dollhouse. There's a car. My kids would play for hours, straight hours of joy, and then they'd put things back. It was mind-blowing. <laughs> then we'd go home, where we have all of these toys, because I'd see them play there, and I'd be like, we should get that. And then there it sat, plus grandparents and aunts and uncles and Christmases and birthdays and Easter all multiplied by four children. You can imagine... My basement sometimes reminds me of a virtual toy store. And we get there, and my kids would be like, there's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. They still claim it. They're full of nonsense. Too many choices make it so we can't choose. But resolutions like dry January and 40 bags in 40 days, they feel accomplishable. They're small. And if instead I consider my purpose in this new year, if I don't resolve so much as see myself as a part of ministry and mission and discipleship, I am apt to feel those too many choices. There is so much to do, so much to change, so much to consider. It's easy to be frozen to sit in the possibility and just stare at God with the question of what now? It's why it's so easy to create goals outside of purpose, because they have end dates and feel attainable and measurable, and discipleship is just none of those things. But it's important to go back to that moment of baptism from Jesus where he transforms from an, a means of a baptism of repentance to a baptism of empowerment, and notice that he doesn't jump from baptism to immediately storming Rome. His ministry starts in calling some disciples. He tells some parables. He sits down in meals with friends and strangers. Jesus doesn't conjure earth-shattering miracles that transform the whole of entire cities. Instead, he stops and notices the people he encounters. 
He takes seriously their concerns and their pain. Jesus stops and he listens, he loves, he changes direction based on the circumstances presented to him, and he acts into the needs presented to him one person at a time. It is the actual answer to the what now feeling, the one that says there are too many choices, the one that says I want to sit in my accomplishment and I don't know where to go from here, the one that gnaws that word yet into all the freshness of the new day. The truth is we don't have all the choices, all the ministries, all the salvic, salvific miracles you have what's before you today. If you just keep your eyes and ears open, you'd be ready to act into them every single time they come. So what now? Well, here's my friend. And they've called me up and they need something or they need an ear. What now? Oh, there's a presented need on Facebook and I can serve into that. What now? Here's an opening to do or to say, to let your ears or hands execute the miracle that God is asking you to provide. And those miracles are usually little. It's why we get so many beginnings. Because it's not about the one right start date or time or method. It's not about the one failure that sets us off track for the whole year. It's not one missed opportunity because it's the last opportunity. Again and again, we are invited to start, to see right before us, to take discipleship right in our path and do something with it. And sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big, sometimes it's something that I do and then I do something new the next day. Sometimes it's huge and I take baby steps day after day towards a work and a ministry that sits before me. Remember, in the beginning there was nothing. And God took it and made light. Our beginnings, whether it's new year, new day, new outlook, you are already something. And it's not about all of the possibilities. It's about the one right there, right in front of you at this moment. So stop asking what now and look, because God is presenting you in front of your face with all of the empowerment and all of the go to it that you need if you're willing to stop, listen, and go. Amen.